Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, Senegalese opposition leader Usman Sonko is given a two month suspended sentence in his libel trial. His supporters say that he's being politically targeted, but should be able to run in next year's election. Also, Kenya sees a third day of protests against the high cost of living and President William Ruto's election, which opposition leader Raila Odinga still claims was stolen. And following his release from prison last week, outspoken Rwandan government critic Paul Rusesabagina is finally back in the US after more than 900 days in detention in Rwanda. But first, Senegalese opposition leader Usman Sonko has been given a two-month suspended sentence after having been found guilty of libel on Thursday. His supporters say that the justice system is being used to target him because of his plans to run in next year's elections. His lawyers say that Thursday's decision, though, shouldn't prevent him from doing so, but he's not out of the legal woods quite yet. Sam Bradpiece tells us more. Senegalese opposition leader Ousmane Sonko was given a two-month suspended sentence and ordered to pay the equivalent of about 300,000 euros to the government minister that he was found guilty of defaming. Now, this might sound tough, but things could have been a lot worse for Mr Sonko. According to Senegal's electoral code, that's the set of laws governing elections here, the sentence handed down to him wasn't severe enough to merit him being disqualified from next year's presidential race. Now, supporters of Mr Sonko appear to be happy with this. They've not taken to the streets en masse, as was expected on Thursday afternoon. But Mr Sonko isn't out of the woods just yet. He still faces separate allegations of rape, of which, if he is found guilty, will certainly disbar him from taking part in next year's presidential race. If anything, the unrest that we've seen in the last couple of weeks is really just the beginning. In Kenya, thousands of people once again joined in marches against the high cost of living. The rallies were called for by opposition leader Raila Odinga and since beginning last Monday have seen protesters clash with police. Loha Bershteka tells us more. Surrounded by his supporters, Raila Odinga slowly makes his way through a largely peaceful crowd. But as the convoy passes a police station, tempers begin to flare. A few protesters throw stones at security forces who respond with warning shots and tear gas. Chaotic scenes, symptomatic of a country on edge. Kenyans are suffering. We are hungry. We are fighting for our rights. We want prices to go down. We just can't take it anymore. It was the third day of nationwide demonstrations in Kenya following Odinga's call for bi-weekly protests earlier this month. The opposition leader is accusing President William Ruto of stealing last year's election and holds him responsible for widespread inflation and unemployment. Sporadic clashes broke out across the capital on Thursday despite the mass deployment of riot police to help contain the violence. Undeterred by the government's decision to outlaw the protests, many Kenyans appeared determined to keep the movement going. Today, tomorrow, tomorrow, but we want to land. We want to land, by the way. We want to land. We want to land. We want to land. Even night, even night, we are very ready. Even night time, if you say 24 hours, we will be 24. He's going 24 hours. Despite the clashes, Thursday's protests were less intense than the previous two, in which two people were killed and hundreds injured. Fearing a repeat of the 2007 post-electoral violence, the international community has called on authorities and protesters to work together in order to appease tensions. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris called Tanzania a champion of democracy on her first full day in the country on Thursday. Harris met with President Samia Salu Hassan, who's been rolling back some of the authoritarian policies of her predecessor, John Magafuli, since his death in 2021. Regional correspondent Vivian Wandera has more. The U.S. vice president is seeking to strengthen ties between Tanzania and the United States after the reign of the late president John Magufuli, who stated that he prefers working with the Chinese as their aid compared to Westerns comes with fewer conditions. Relations between the two countries have improved under President Suluhu's administration as she promised to let democracy thrive. However, there are still questions on the human rights situation in the country. 
Suluhu, who took over as president after Magufuli died in office in 2021, is following a different path and rebuilding relations with the international community. Unlike her predecessor, she has taken several trips outside the country to bid for foreign investments and trade. Kamala Harris' office announced plans to improve trade and other aspects of bilateral relations with the signing of a memorandum of understanding with U.S. Exim Bank and the Tanzanian government. This will facilitate $500 million in export financing for Tanzania's government to support export of goods and services in different sectors. At a press conference with the two leaders, President Suluhu hailed Tanzania for being the first country to host a female president and vice president and also thanked the U.S. for providing aid that has helped improve different government sectors. Suluhu added that Tanzania is looking forward to hosting President Joe Biden in the country. Nigeria's Secret Service has claimed that it's identified key players behind an alleged plan to create an interim government as President Mohamedou Yuhari hands over to President-elect Bola Tinubu on May the 29th. Now, Tinubu won February's election in disputed polls. Sam Alokoya joins us now with more on this. Sam, so the Department of State Services is calling it a plot. Is there that much to it? Well, that's what they said, that uh, there's a plot to stop uh, the swearing-in of uh, Bola Tinubu in, uh, in May, uh, when he ought to be sworn in. And they said some unnamed persons are uh, trying to do this by protest and then seeking, getting on frivolous uh, court injunction. And this is quite a frightening. Uh, it, it will be serious if this were true, because it will amount to a crime of treason if you try to stop the inauguration of the government or you try to forcefully change the government. But many will say that it's just a degree of intimidation. The opposition has, one that has been um, carrying out protests and is in court seeking to overturn the victory of uh, Bolatino. So essentially, it looks as if the Secret Service is trying to use this, te this technique to stop the opposition from seeking justice. From what he said was, uh, what he said is uh, an unfair and election that was not very, very credible. So some are highly cynical, skeptical about the likelihood of this being a plot, and think it's more of a, a ploy by the Secret Service to try and uh, intimidate those who might be trying to find legal redress for their belief that the uh, election may not have been. Uh, quite all above board. Um, when it comes to those challenges, where do things stand? Well, the opposition, we have two key parties, the ruling PDP and the, sorry, the main opposition party, PDP, and then the other one, the Labour Party, both have gone to court to challenge this victory. Each of them is claiming victory. So for the first time in Nigeria, we are seeing two party, three parties claiming victory. They are in court at the moment, but though the case has not fully started, they've uh, asked for materials that were used to conduct this election. They said when they get these materials, it will enable them to prove their case that the elections were actually not free and fair. They said uh, the, mater the material, the results were collated manually rather than being transmitted electronically. They said uh, a lot of figures were altered. They said uh, there was violence, there was voter intimidation, and this was the basis on which uh, Bola Tinumbu, candidate of the ruling party, won this election. So both side, both uh, opposition parties are trying to overturn this victory. Uh, time may not be on their side because uh, by May, uh, Bola Tinumbu will be sworn in, and it might be a bit uh, difficult if you have a sitting president to overturn his victory. Thanks very much. Sam Olokoya there for us. Now, South Africa has doubled down on its friendship with Russia and sidestepped questions on whether the government will execute an arrest warrant against Vladimir Putin if he attends a summit in South Africa later this year. Nadine Tron talks us through. 
On Thursday, the minister in the presidency was asked if South Africa will arrest Russian President Vladimir Putin. The International Criminal Court issued a warrant for Putin's arrest on war crimes. He is expected to visit South Africa for the BRICS summit in August. And as South Africa is a member of the ICC, the country is bound to arrest him. But the minister couldn't answer the question, saying that the cabinet is waiting on legal advice. Meanwhile, the Minister of International Relations, Naledi Pandor, hosted the Russian Minister of Natural Resources and the Environment in Pretoria. Naledi Pandor and Alexander Kozlov co-chaired the 17th Joint Intergovernmental Committee for Trade and Economic Relations between the two countries. You would see, Minister, that there's a great deal of media interest in our meeting because there are some who don't wish us to have relations with an old historical threat. We have made it clear that Russia is a friend and we've had cooperative partnerships for many, many years, including partnerships as we combated the apartheid regime. Pandor also said she's looking forward to support from the liberations at BRICS and hopes to further cooperation between South Africa and Russia. Following his release from prison last week, outspoken Rwandan government critic Paul Rusesa Bagina is back on U.S. soil. He was released last week after more than 900 days in detention in Rwanda on terror charges. His conviction sparked international concerns about transparency and fairness of the trial. Jean-Amil Jamin tells us more. After more than 900 days in prison, Rwanda's Paul Rusesa Bagina touches down in the United States now as a free man. We're glad to have him back on US soil, reunited with his family and friends who've long waited for this day to come. I'm grateful to those we worked closely with in the Rwandan government to make this possible. Rusesa Bagina is credited for saving hundreds of Tutsi lives during the 1994 Rwandan genocide, where his actions as a Kigali hotel manager inspired the film Hotel Rwanda. Over several years, he became a fierce critic of Rwanda's longtime president, Paul Kagame, leading him to be seen as an enemy of the state. There is no doubt that Mr. Rusesa Bagina was convicted because he deserved it. In August 2020, Rusesa Bagina was arrested when his private plane from Dubai skipped his intended destination of Burundi, arriving in Kigali instead. His detention threw a spotlight on Rwanda's record of crushing political dissent and free speech under Kagame's leadership. In a car, he is in Rwanda illegally. He came against his own free will. Then in September 2021, Rusesa Bagina was sentenced to 25 years in prison for allegedly backing an armed rebel group. Rusesa Bagina is guilty of being a member of a terror group and participating in terror activities. The trial was denounced as a sham by his supporters as well as Washington. At the end of 2022, though, Talks began between Rwanda and the United States government for his release, with Qatar acting as a mediator. His sentence was lifted last week, allowing Rusesa Bagina to live out the rest of his life in the United States, where he is a permanent resident. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. On France 24, watch exclusive interviews with the world's most influential personalities. We need to act together because we're protecting our freedom. Encounters with key political leaders. L'inquiétude, elle est extrême. Leading figures from the worlds of culture, sport, and science. La science, la recherche, la découverte, le progrès, c'est important. C'est pas des, pas des mots qui sont vides. Whatever you think is right, you can do. Watch the interview. A meeting of ideas on France 24 and France24.com. Liberté, égalité, actualité.